Lecture 37 on Conscious Mental Life So far in this course we've focused mostly on the principles that govern conscious mental life. Conscious sensation and perception, conscious learning and memory, conscious thinking, speaking, communicating, and so on. Conscious feelings, conscious desires. And that leads us to raise the question of whether there are aspects of mental life of which we're not consciously aware. What does it mean? Does it mean anything at all to say we have unconscious sensations or percepts or unconscious memories? Some psychologists have rejected the notion of unconscious mental life out of hand as a contradiction in terms. For them, having a mind and being conscious are pretty much one and the same thing. But others have suggested that there might be more to mental life than what we're consciously aware of. Writing before the advent of scientific psychology, Immanuel Kant thought that it might very well be possible to have ideas yet not be conscious of them, and that we could become aware indirectly of these unconscious ideas by observing the, their effects on our experience, thought, and action. But first, before we start talking seriously about unconscious mental life, let's be clear on what we mean by consciousness. First, it would seem that consciousness entails two somewhat different things. First, monitoring ourselves and our environment so that percepts, memories, thoughts, feelings, and desires come to be accurately represented in our phenomenal awareness. And second, controlling ourselves and our environment so that we're able to voluntarily initiate and terminate behavioral and cognitive activities. To be able to voluntarily control not just what we do in our behavior, but what we think and what we feel and what we want. Conscious awareness and conscious control are two different things, but they're obviously related because it would seem to be difficult to consciously control something that we're not consciously aware of. Now we've already seen, back in the lectures on short-term and working memory and attention, one aspect of unconscious mental life, which has to do with the distinction between automatic and controlled processes. You'll remember that automatic processes are those that are inevitably evoked by the appearance of some stimulus event in the environment. Once evoked, they run incorrigibly to completion. They can't be stopped. They're executed efficiently in the sense that they consume little or no cognitive resources. And they can be processed in parallel, which means that they don't interfere with other ongoing mental activities. Controlled processing is generally identified with conscious processing. We're aware of what we're doing, and we can control it voluntarily. Automatic processing, by the same token, seems to be unconscious in the strict sense of, of the term. Automatic processes operate outside of our phenomenal awareness, and they also operate outside of our voluntary control. In a sense, automatic processes are exemplified by the unconscious inferences that Helmholtz discussed as being at the root of perception. So, for example, the relative distance of two objects from the observer can be inferred from the relative differences in the size of the image that the objects cast on the retina. We make this inference by employing the size-distance rule, that distance is an inverse function of the size of the retinal image, but we're not conscious of making this inference. The inference is made automatically by our visual apparatus. More broadly, the idea is that automatic unconscious processes are responsible for generating conscious mental contents. Our conscious sensations and percepts and memories, our conscious thoughts and feelings and desires, are to a large extent generated by these unconscious automatic processes. So automatic processes can be evoked by conscious sensations and percepts, and they can create conscious sensations and percepts. The next question is, can sensations and percepts themselves also be unconscious? Apparently, the answer is yes. 
less than a hundred years after Immanuel Kant raised the question of whether unconscious sensations and percepts were possible, Peirce and Jastrow showed that they in fact existed in their experiments on subliminal perception. You'll remember that in this experiment, subjects were asked to identify which of two stimuli were the brighter or the heavier, and then the difference between the stimuli was systematically reduced until the subjects couldn't detect a difference any longer. Yet when forced to choose which stimulus was the brighter or the heavier, they were right significantly more often than we'd expect by chance. They were not consciously aware of the difference between the two stimuli, but that difference registered in their sensory system somehow and affected their choices, their guesses, outside of conscious awareness. In modern psychology, initial evidence for the existence of unconscious mental contents as opposed to unconscious mental processes was provided by laboratory studies of patients with the amnesic syndrome caused by bilateral damage to the hippocampus and other structures in the uh, medial portion of the temporal lobes. And we discussed earlier the pioneering study by Warrington and Weisskrantz in which amnesic patients studied a list of words and then received tests of free recall and recognition. Compared to the control subjects, the amnesic patients were much less likely to produce items from the studied list on those tests, and that's pretty much the definition of amnesia. However, when presented with fragments or word stems and asked to guess the corresponding word, amnesic patients were much more likely to produce the list items. In fact, their performance on the completion task was no different from that of controls. This is known as a priming effect. Apparently, the act of studying the word lists left a trace in memory. The amnesic patients didn't have conscious access to that memory trace, which is why they performed so poorly on tests of free recall and recognition. But traces of the studied words had been encoded anyway and remained in storage and were able to influence the amnesic patient's performance on the stem and fragment completion test. Priming shows that some memory of the items encountered in the study phase was retained despite the patient's failure of conscious recall or recognition. Based on results such as these, Daniel Schachter and his colleagues have distinguished between two expressions of memory, explicit and implicit. Explicit memory is the conscious recollection of a past event, as, it, as indicated by performance on recall or recognition tests. Implicit memory refers to the effect of a past event on some task which does not require conscious re recollection, like priming effects. Implicit effect memory refers to any effect of a past event on the individual's experience, thought, or action and the point of the amnesia experiment is that it shows that implicit memory can be preserved even when explicit memory is grossly impaired. Implicit memory can be spared even in the absence of conscious recollection. Subsequent research has confirmed the essential findings of Warrington and Weisskrantz that explicit, conscious, and implicit, unconscious memory can be dissociated in the amnesic syndrome but this dissociation between explicit and implicit memory has also been observed in a wide variety of other states involving amnesia. For example, the amnesia that occurs as a incidental byproduct of electroconvulsive therapy in the treatment of depression. Implicit memory is also preserved for information presented during general anesthesia and also conscious sedation another medical procedure. Explicit and implicit memory are dissociated in normal aging and also in dementias like Alzheimer's disease. In post-hypnotic amnesia, hypnotized subjects come out of hypnosis and they can't remember the things they did or the things they experienced while they were hypnotized. Yet they'll show priming effects for a list of words they studied while they were hypnotized and clinical patients with various forms of dissociative disorder, like so-called psychogenic amnesia, 
fugue, or multiple personality disorder will also show priming effects created by past events which they can't consciously rec uh, recollect. In all these cases, implicit memory is unconscious memory. It's a trace of past experience stored in memory which influences the person's ongoing experience, thought, or action in the absence of conscious recollection. Just as implicit memory refers to the influence of past events that cannot be consciously remembered, so implicit perception refers to the influence of events in the current stimulus environment that cannot be consciously perceived. Explicit perception is conscious perception, as exemplified by our, ab our ability to consciously detect a stimulus in the environment, our ability to perceive its distance or its motion or its form, to identify the object and to categorize it. Implicit perception, by analogy with implicit memory, refers to any effect of a, of a current event, an event in the current stimulus environment, on the individual's experience, thought, or action, in the absence of conscious perception. Implicit perception includes cases of so-called subliminal perception, as in the person Jastrow experiment and many experiments like it that have been done in the century or more since then. Implicit perception is also implicated in research on what is known as masked priming. In masking, stimuli are presented at intensities that would normally be sufficient to allow them to be perceived under ordinary circumstances. This is different from the person Jastrow case where the stimuli were presented at intensities that were too low to be consciously perceived. So the stimuli themselves are nominally supraliminal, above the threshold for conscious perception, but they're followed by a masking stimulus that effectively renders them invisible. This masking stimulus is typically a visual pattern, like a string of letters. In a famous experiment, Anthony Marcel of Cambridge University carried out a series of studies of masked semantic priming, in which words like doctor facilitated lexical decisions of semantically related targets like nurse. Now ordinarily, you'd think that was no big deal because doctor and nurse are semantically related, and so presentation of one would ordinarily prime processing of the other. But because of the masking stimulus, the subjects were not consciously aware of the prime. They were not consciously aware of the word doctor. Yet the word was perceived unconsciously, and we know it was perceived unconsciously because masked presentation of the word doctor primed processing of the semantically related word nurse. So implicit perception goes beyond merely subliminal perception goes beyond the simple question of whether a stimulus is present in the environment. But in this case, the subjects were actually reading words and understanding them, analyzing them for meaning, despite the fact that they weren't consciously aware of the words. Masked semantic priming gives very good evidence for implicit perception, unconscious perception. And as was the case with memory, it's now understood that explicit and implicit perception, conscious and unconscious perception, can be dissociated in a wide variety of conditions. We've already talked about so-called subliminal perception and also masked priming, as in the Marcel experiment. The priming that occurs for stimuli presented during general anesthesia could just as easily be thought of as examples of implicit perception as they are examples of implicit memory, because of course an adequately anesthetized patient isn't aware of anything that's going on at the time it goes on. Implicit perception has also been preserved, shown to be preserved, in a number of neurological syndromes, like blind sight, visual neglect, and prosopagnosia, where patients don't have the conscious experience of seeing or perceiving but are still able to respond to a perceptual stimulus. Blind sight patients have damage to area V1, the primary visual cortex. They don't consciously see anything, yet they can make decisions that are better than chance about whether there's an object present in the environment, whether it's moving or stable 
and in some cases even what the form of the object is. In visual neglect, patients with another form of brain damage appear not to see, they appear not to be attentive to stimuli that are present in one half of their visual field, typically the left half. Yet careful testing shows that they're responsive to features of those stimuli even though they're not paying any attention to them and don't see them. Patients with prosopagnosia can't recognize the faces of people who ought to be familiar to them, whether it's their spouses or their children or the president. Yet if you measure their physiological responses to these faces, you'll see that they respond physiologically in a different manner to familiar faces, objectively familiar faces, than they do to the faces of people that are completely unknown to them. Hypnotized subjects can receive suggestions for blindness, for deafness, or for tactile anesthesia, after which they don't see or hear or feel things that they're supposed to see or hear or feel. Yet we can show through careful testing using priming paradigms and other kinds of procedures that they're actually responding to these stimuli outside of conscious awareness. Something similar can be observed in a category of psychiatric disorder, a category of mental illness known as the conversion disorders. These used to be known as hysterical disorders or hysteria where the patient claims to be unable to see or hear despite the fact that there's nothing wrong physically with their sensory systems. Implicit perception is preserved when stimuli are presented to normal subjects. Subjects who are neurologically intact and don't have any kind of psychiatric disorder but the stimuli are presented outside the field of attention. So in a wide variety of conditions people are found to be responsive. They show priming effects and other kinds of effects to stimuli of which they're not consciously aware. That's the essence of implicit or unconscious perception. Apparently subjects can also learn unconsciously in the sense that new knowledge acquired through experience can affect their ongoing behavior without their being aware of what they've learned or even the fact that they've learned anything at all. Again, paralleling the definition of explicit and implicit memory, we can define explicit learning in terms of the person's conscious access to knowledge that he or she has acquired through experience. Whether that knowledge is semantic knowledge, like the meanings of words or some historical fact, or procedural knowledge, some skill or rule that you've learned. On the other hand, implicit learning refers to any effect of this new knowledge acquired through experience on the person's experience, thought, or action, even though the person has no conscious awareness of that knowledge. Here's an example. In a series of studies, Arthur Reber asked his subjects to memorize strings of letters which were generated by a rule a grammatical rule which specified which letters can appear in the string, how many times, and in what order. But the subjects weren't informed of the existence of these grammatical rules. They were just asked to memorize the strings of letters. After reaching a criterion of learning, that is, they were able to repeat the letters back to Reber, the subjects were informed that the studied strings had been generated by a grammar, by a set of rules, and they were then asked to discriminate between new letter strings which were also generated by the grammar and others that were not. Reber found that his subjects were able to make this distinction between grammatical and ungrammatical letter strings reliably above chance, but when asked they were unable to tell them what the grammar was. They had obviously learned the grammar in whole or in part through their exposure to the letter strings and they were able to use this knowledge to distinguish between grammatical strings and ungrammatical strings, but they were unable to specify what the grammatical rules were. They acquired new knowledge, knowledge of the grammar, and the knowledge affected their behavior, but they had no conscious access to the knowledge they had acquired through experience. Reber's experiments showed that subjects could unconsciously learn a fairly complex artificial grammar. Now they were certainly 
aware of memorizing the letter strings at the time they were presented to them for study. So this isn't a case of unconscious perception. And they were obviously able to remember the letter strings themselves, so this isn't a case of unconscious memory either. It's a case of unconscious learning. They've acquired knowledge of the grammar through experience, through exposure to grammatical letter strings, but they're not aware of what they've learned. Now you can think of Reber's classification task as a kind of categorization task. Subjects are asked to classify strings as grammatical or ungrammatical, and similar findings have been made in other domains of categorization. Subjects are able to classify two objects as similar or as belonging to the same category, even though they're not able to say what that category is or what features are critical for category membership. Subjects are also able to detect the covariation between two events, picking up on the association between them, much in the manner of classical conditioning. They're consciously aware of the two events, but what they're not consciously aware of is the fact that the two events are associated, yet they behave as if they are. They've learned the association between the events, even though they're not consciously aware of that association. Similarly, subjects can pick up information about the sequencing of events, even though when you ask them, they don't think that the events are occurring in any particular sequence. And finally, subjects can learn to control complex systems, even though they can't tell you the rule that relates inputs to the system to outputs from the system. In each of these cases, subjects have acquired new knowledge through experience, that's the definition of learning, but they're unaware of the knowledge they've acquired. That's why the learning is implicit, unconscious, not explicit, and conscious. And there's also evidence of implicit or unconscious thought. And this is particularly surprising because, in a sense, thinking really defines consciousness. When we talk about reasoning and problem solving, making judgments, making decisions, we're almost by definition talking about conscious cognitive activity. But it turns out that there is some evidence for implicit thought, where subjects are influenced by ideas, by thoughts, that they're not consciously aware of. Here's an example of what I mean research done by Kenneth Bowers and his colleagues at the University of Waterloo. In their experiments, Bowers and his colleagues employed a clever variation on a procedure known as the remote associates test. In the remote associates test, subjects are pre presented with three Q words and are asked to generate a fourth word, a target word, that all three Qs have as a common associate. For example, blank, white, and lines. Take a moment and see if you can think of a word that all three of these words have in common as an associate. That word is paper. There's blank paper and paper with lines on it and white paper. Now what Bowers and his co-workers did was to elaborate the remote associates test into what they called the dyads of triads test. In the dyads of triads task, subjects are presented with two triplets of words, one of which, the coherent triad, is united by a common associate, and the other one, the incoherent triad, just isn't. So blank and white and lines have the word paper in common whereas this other triad, still, pages, and music, those three words don't have any associate in common. Now maybe you can think of one, but as far as the published norms for word associations are concerned, there isn't one. Anyway, the task for Bauer's subjects was twofold. Their first task was to respond with the common associate that unites the coherent triad to say paper. But if they couldn't do that within a certain period of time, they were given a second task, which is simply to guess which triad was the coherent one. 
to guess which triad of words actually had an associate in common. The coherent triads used in the dyads of triads task are all soluble, but they're also fairly difficult, so that many otherwise intelligent people with good verbal abilities fail to solve them. Nevertheless, Bowers and his colleagues found that subjects could reliably discriminate between coherent and incoherent triads even when they could not generate the solution to the coherent triad itself. Much as Peirce and Jastro found that observers could distinguish which of two weights were heavier and which of two lights were brighter even though they could not detect any difference between them, Bowers subjects were able to, to guess which triads were coherent and which incoherent even though they were unaware of the solution to the coherent set. So the target of the coherent triad, the solution to the problem, is influencing the subject's behavior even though they're not consciously aware of what the solution is, even though they're not consciously aware of the target. Now the interesting thing about this is that the target is not a percept. It's not as if the word paper is being presented subliminally or in a masked fashion. And it's not a memory either. It's not as if the subject saw the word paper earlier in the experiment and forgot all about it. The mental state that's influencing subjects' performance on the dyads of triads task isn't a percept and it's not a memory. It's a thought. But it's a thought of which they're not conscious. It's an implicit thought, not an explicit conscious thought. The idea of unconscious thought, the idea that implicit thoughts can be dissociated from explicit conscious thoughts takes a little while to get your head around, I'll admit. But there's increasing evidence for the idea that implicit and explicit thought can be dissociated. First there are experiments modeled after the dyads of triads paradigm. There's also evidence that presentation of a coherent triad can prime a processing of the target even though the subjects aren't aware of what the target is. Certain neurological patients with damage to areas of the prefrontal cortex can respond differently to risky choices as opposed to safe choices. Risky choices where there's a low probability of success, safe choices where there's a high probability of success, even though they're not consciously aware of the probabilities involved. Again, they seem to have a representation of the probabilities, but they're not consciously aware of that representation. And children can show something like implicit thought in experiments on insight learning. If you give young children a series of problems, all of which can be solved the same way, you can show by decreases in the amount of time it takes them to solve each successive problem that they've got it. Even though when you ask them they'll tell you they don't know what the strategy is. They're using a strategy to solve problems that they don't know they're using because they don't know they have the strategy. The implicit thoughts revealed by Bauer's experiments with the dyads of triads procedure seem to have a lot in common with intuition. Those times when something just rings a bell or just seems right even though we can't say exactly why that's the case. These intuitive feelings in turn seem to be related to the stages of thought described by Wallace. Preparation includes the accumulation of knowledge and the mastery of the rules which govern the particular domain in which some problem resides and it also includes the adoption of a problem-solving attitude, including the awareness that there is a problem to be solved and the deliberate analysis of the problem itself. If it seems that the problem can be solved by a well-known algorithm, the problem may be solved at this point, and the thinker moves straight to the verification stage, which I'll discuss later. Otherwise, the thinker proceeds to work actively on the problem. But if the problem is very difficult, the thinker may give up, or at least take a break, and here's where things get interesting. Wallace proposed that the preparation stage is followed by a stage he called incubation, in which the thinker is not consciously thinking about the problem, 
but in Wallace's view problem-solving activity goes on instead outside of conscious awareness. Incubation is followed by intimation, the state of rising consciousness which indicates that the fully conscious flash of success is coming. This intimation stage is otherwise known as intuition. Then there's the illumination stage in which the solution to the problem appears in the consciousness of the thinker. This is a stage that we want to call insight. And finally the verification stage in which the solution, however it's been arrived at, is confirmed and refined, or shown to be incorrect, in which case the problem solver returns to the preparation stage. Incubation, or unconscious problem solving, plays an important role in the mythology of problem solving. There are a lot of instances where scientists and artists of various kinds have claimed to be confronted by some problem that appears to be insoluble, they set the problem aside for a while, and then all of a sudden the solution to the problem appears in a flash. It's as if they've been working on it unconsciously all that time. Incubation is part of the mythology of problem solving, but it's also one of the most controversial topics in the literature on thinking and reasoning, and many researchers and theorists deny that it occurs at all. In principle, however, Incubation is the stage at which the solution to a problem is coming into consciousness, but it hasn't yet arrived. But intuition appears to be what's going on in Bauer's dyads of triads task. The solution to the coherent triad, the target of the problem, has not yet risen to the level of conscious awareness. But unconsciously, it influences the subject's discrimination between coherent and incoherent triads, as well as the subject's performance on other kinds of tasks. Intuitions arise in the period of incubation and persist there as well until they emerge into consciousness in the form of a full-blown insight. Now these intuitive feelings are also controversial and some theorists argue that they're misleading more often than not, and other theorists believe that too much conscious thought can actually make for bad decision making and that people are better relying on their automatically generated unconscious intuitions. But in Wallace's stages of thought we can see two different aspects of unconscious thinking. Incubation, where it's claimed the thinking itself goes on outside of conscious awareness. And intuition, where it appears the solution to the problem is actually available, but not yet accessible to consciousness. It has not yet appeared in the form of a full-blown conscious insight. So there's our first view of unconscious mental life. What I have called the cognitive unconscious consists, in the first place, of automatic processes evoked in the course of perceiving and learning and remembering and thinking. These automatic processes are unconscious because they operate outside of our conscious awareness but also outside of our conscious control. And second, we have documented dissociations between explicit and implicit perception, memory, learning, and thought. Implicit percepts influence our experience, thought, and action in the absence of conscious awareness of their presence in the environment. Implicit memories influence our experience, thought, and action in the absence of conscious recollection of their occurrence in the past. In implicit learning, we employ knowledge acquired through experience without being consciously aware of what that knowledge is. And implicit thought our experience, thought, and action is influenced by ideas that are not themselves either percepts or memories, even though we're not aware of what these ideas are. To have ideas and yet not be conscious of them, there seems to be a contradiction in that, for how can we know that we have them if we're not conscious of them? That's what Kant wrote at the end of the 18th century. He also wrote, Nevertheless, we may become aware indirectly 
that we have an idea even though we be not directly cognizant of the same. That indirect influence comes in the form of priming effects and other effects that reveal implicit perception, memory, learning, and thought. But of course cognition isn't all there is to the mind. What about emotion? What about motivation? Can our feelings and desires affect our experience, thought, and action even though we're not aware of them? Certainly our feelings and desires can be generated by unconscious automatic processes. But in that case we'd still be aware of what we feel and of what we desire. As in the case of unconscious cognition, the really interesting question is whether we can have feelings and desires the way we have ideas and yet not be conscious of them. Work on unconscious emotion and unconscious motivation is not nearly as advanced as work on unconscious cognition. But still there are reasons for thinking that we have unconscious feelings and unconscious desires the same way we have unconscious ideas. Again, by analogy to implicit memory, we can define implicit motivation as any effect on experience, thought, or action that's attributable to the individual's motivational state in the absence of the person's conscious awareness of that motivational state. This contrasts with explicit motivation, which entails the person's conscious awareness of his or her drives, wants, needs, and goals. People's explicit or conscious motives are typically assessed by means of standard personality questionnaires. If somebody endorses questionnaire items like, I enjoy the challenge of a difficult task, or I maintain high standards in everything I do, or I have a strong desire to excel, we can be pretty sure that they have a high level of achievement motivation. And we can be pretty sure that they know it, they're consciously aware of it. By contrast, implicit motives are commonly assessed through the subject's performance on a test known as the thematic apperception test, sometimes called the picture story exercise. In this procedure, the subject is presented with a picture, a picture that's somewhat ambiguous, and is asked to tell a story about it, a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end that talks about what the protagonist, the main figures in the picture, are thinking. These stories are then coded for imagery uh, that's relevant to such motives as achievement or power or affiliation or intimacy. So for example, is the child being made to practice and doesn't like it? Or is the child thinking about having a career as a concert violinist? Is the acrobat afraid or is he confidently about to perform before the crowned heads of Europe? One thing we know for sure is that assessment of motives by means of the thematic apperception test or the picture story exercise do not relate strongly to assessments of the same motives by means of questionnaires. Ordinarily we'd expect two tests assessing the same personality trait, like the need for achievement, to correlate highly with each other, correlation coefficients in the 60s or 70s or even 80s. By contrast, the correlation between thematic apperception test measures of achievement motivation and questionnaire measures of achievement motivation are near zero. The implication is that someone can score high on a thematic apperception test assessment of achievement motivation but score low on a questionnaire measure. In that case we might want to say the person really is motivated to achieve, he just doesn't know it. He just doesn't consciously present himself that way or perceive himself that way. Similar findings have been obtained with respect to the need for power or the need to for dominance and also the need for affiliation. The fact that ostensible measures of explicit and implicit motives are so poorly correlated with each other doesn't by itself prove anything, but it does suggest that people's behavior may be driven by motives of which they themselves are not aware.
Similarly, Peter Lang's multiple systems theory of emotion suggests that we may be able to dissociate implicit unconscious emotion from explicit conscious emotion. Recall that the theory asserts that there are three different components to every emotional state, a verbal cognitive component representing the subjective experience of emotion, overt motor behavior, and covert physiological activity. Ordinarily, we think of these three components as going together, as co-varying. But in principle, they could be dissociated from each other. If there's a disruption in the verbal cognitive system underlying the subjective experience of emotion, a person might be unaware of being in an emotional state, but he still might behave as if he is in an emotional state in terms of his overt motor behavior or his covert physiological activity. In this sense, and again by analogy to implicit memory, we can define explicit emotion as the person's subjective mood state, subjective affective response or feeling state, and implicit emotion as any effect on the person's experience, thought, or action that's attributable to the individual's emotional state, even in the absence of the person's conscious awareness of that emotional state. And again, these effects are more like, most likely to be seen either in terms of the person's overt motor responses, like facial expressions, or covert physiological responses, such as can be measured in the autonomic nervous system. Lang's multiple systems theory of emotion predicts that there might be dissociations between conscious and unconscious emotion. And Joseph Ledoux's neuroscientific approach suggests that such dissociations could in fact happen if, for example, the brain module that mediates the verbal cognitive component of emotion is damaged somehow, but the brain modules that mediate the overt and covert components of emotion are, re, remain intact. So it can all work out in theory, but it'd be nice to have a little bit of evidence. Some evidence along these lines comes from a series of experiments by Winkelmann and his colleagues. They presented subjects with subliminal exposures to happy or angry faces, presented happy or angry faces on a computer screen, but masked in such a way that the subjects did not consciously perceive them. Now, in general, exposure to emotional faces tends to induce the same emotion in the observer. And this is true for subliminal as well as for superliminal exposures. And in fact, the fact that subliminal exposure to emotional faces induces similar emotions in the observer is one of the pieces of evidence for subliminal perception. We also know that mood states influence consummatory behavior. Subjects will eat more and drink more when they're in a happy state than if they're in a sad state. So these investigators exposed their subjects to pictures of happy or angry faces, followed by a masking stimulus which effectively rendered the faces invisible. When subjects were asked to rate their mood state, in fact, they showed little distinction between happy and angry. Even though they had been exposed to happy faces or angry faces, they didn't actually feel any different. But subjects exposed to happy faces poured and consumed more of a fruit drink than those exposed to fearful faces. They said they wanted more of the drink, and they said they'd pay more for it. So even though the subjects didn't consciously feel any different, as reflected in their self-ratings, these investigators argue that the masked presentation of the happy and angry faces induced unconscious positive and negative emotional states. Unconscious emotional states that affected their consummatory behavior in the same way that we'd expect conscious emotional states to do. Although the research I've just described gives us sufficient reason for taking unconscious mental life seriously, it has to be said that the evidence in each of these domains is not equally strong. I think that the evidence for implicit perception and memory is quite convincing, establishing the existence of unconscious perception and memory um, to the satisfaction of all but a very few critics. Implicit learning is also very widely accepted, 
though a little bit more controversial. Evidence for implicit thought is on somewhat softer ground, but only because there have been relatively few studies in this domain compared to perception and memory and learning. The same holds true for unconscious motives and unconscious emotions. Research in these domains is just getting off the ground. Writing in the Principles of Psychology more than a hundred years ago, when scientific psychology was still in its infancy, William James warned that the unconscious was the sovereign means for believing what one likes in psychology and of turning what might become a science into a tumbling ground for whimsies. It's all too easy for us, as psychologists or even as ordinary people on the street, to tell people what they unconsciously believe or think or feel or want. How could they possibly contradict us? But studies of automatic and controlled processes, and of explicit and implicit perception, memory, learning, and the like, offer a solution to James's warning, because they offer a strict criteria for identifying unconscious mental processes and unconscious mental states, and for making inferences about subjects' unconscious mental lives, and tying these inferences to objective evidence of their behavior in the controlled environment of the laboratory. The result is that we can now talk about the unconscious in a scientifically respectable way and proceed to discover its scope and limitations and identify its neural correlates through the usual sorts of laboratory research. <laughs>